Hello everyone! My name is Evie Lupine and welcome back to my channel. Today we have another wonderful interview. I'm so excited because today we are talking to the one, the only, Jillian Keenan, who I actually found through watching videos with all of you over on Patreon. And she does amazing videos about spanking and spanko culture and BDSM and we're going to talk about all that today, but before I steal your thunder, would you like to introduce yourself to the audience, Jillian? Yeah. Hello, everyone. I'm Jillian. I'm a, an author and journalist, and I sort of stumbled into YouTube by accident. Mm. A couple of years ago, HarperCollins published a book that I wrote about spanking and about how, specifically how Shakespeare helped me come to terms with my own innate, unchosen, and lifelong paraphilia. And I was just living in Nairobi, being a journalist in Kenya, and I kept getting the same email questions in response to my book. Mm. And I'm a lazy person, so I didn't want to write the same email answers over and over again. So I thought, okay, I'll make five YouTube videos with my answers to the questions I get most often, and then I can just send links to the videos and be done. Mm. Uh, but instead of being done in five videos, I, I have ended up sticking with it. So um, I'm very excited to be here. Yeah, thank you so much. I I feel like we have a very weirdly similar start for different reasons. Because I got started doing YouTube because I was on Instagram. And at the time, this was like before TikTok or anything, this was like 2015, somewhere in there. And everyone was into pet play and DDLG, like that was the hot new thing on the kink market. And I was one of the only people that was going in person to classes and I had a local dungeon I went to. And so I would get questions from people about pet play and power exchange. And, you know, you answer enough DMs, and you're just like, I should just make a video about this. And so I got started making videos because I just, I wanted to be able to be, hey, here's an answer to your question. And I've reviewed and like rewatched some of my older videos. And like, I have one that's like, I don't know, the sixth video I ever made where I'm like, I think I'm almost done with this series. And like five <laughs> years later, here I am making YouTube videos. So totally, totally get that. But yeah, I'm curious, like, was it specifically spanking in relation to the book that motivated you to, like, want to keep making YouTube videos? Or did you ever, like, want to branch out into, like, different topic areas besides spanking? Uh, I certainly have considered other topics. Um, I interviewed a friend of mine who is a spanko, mm -hmm. but also has a, another fetish, as she says, um, which in her case is tickling. So I did a video where I interviewed her about the tickling community because I'm not, I mean, I'm not at all well versed in our cousins on the fetish family tree. Uh, mm -hmm. And I do want to learn more. So I, I talked to her about the tickling community. And I certainly would love to do more videos like that. But I'm sure you've found this in your own work. Um, it definitely can be tricky to find people who are willing to put their faces on the internet talking about mm. uh, some some special interests. So yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I definitely have people that I know in my local scene and friends I've had over the years why I, I would love to be able to have them on to share their stories, but they work with children or in the government. Right. And like, they would never touch that with a 10 foot pole. And I totally respect that like privacy is so important in kink. That's why we have scene names. That's why you get to choose the level of like privacy and like how much your real life overlaps with your kink life. I totally get all of that. But I think it's also important to remember, like you mentioned with tickling and spanking and everything else that, you know, I try to talk about BDSM from like a holistic, like all the branches of the BDSM community, but really I'm more of a generalist, right? I don't know about like the latex community or the tickling fetishes or the spankos, which is why you're here to kind of help educate us about that today or the gore lifestyle or like MS relationships. Like there's so many little tiny little nooks and crannies within kink and also like it's important to remember for your own journey of exploration that just because one thing doesn't really speak to you doesn't mean that there's not a community or a culture out there that's not going to like vibe with you and be on your same yeah. wavelength for what it is you're looking for. Yeah, 100%. And I'm really excited to learn from you because I am not a generalist, either mm -hmm. as a YouTuber or as a person. Mm -hmm. And I'm really eager to learn more about um, looking at our world from a like a bird's eye perspective, looking mm -hmm. at the big picture. Yeah, so I would love to get into that, but I think let's start by maybe we should back up and explain like what does spanko mean? And if you know, like where does that term come from originally? I'm getting like Australian vibes from it, but I'm not entirely sure. 
Yeah. So um, I personally do not love the word spanko. Mm. To me, it sounds like a processed food product. And uh, there's nothing more thoroughly unerotic than that. But I, you know, I didn't choose the words. I didn't write the language. So mm. it's kind of the term we're stuck with. Uh, my understanding is that it originated as an abbreviation of spanko file. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, but yeah, I guess I just think of panko breadcrumbs or like spray cheese or something. So yeah. I prefer um, like spanking fetishist or someone with a spanking paraphilia to get really clinical, I guess. Mm. Um, but, you know, any any term is fine. <laughs> yeah. So with the term spanko or whatever insert word here you want to use, whatever term that is, is it always a fetish or always a paraphilia or is it something that people can choose to engage in like recreationally because they want to relax or for other reasons so definitely it is something that people can choose to engage in because they're curious or because they want to spice up their sex lives or because they want to relax there could be a lot of reasons for engaging in spanking play um my impression of the spanko community of the people i know within the community of my experience um, is that the difference, in my opinion, and again, this is all going to be my opinion, this, I'm sure that there will be a million people with different opinions, is that the difference between a spanko and someone who just chooses to incorporate some spanking play into a life or a relationship for fun or for whatever reason, is that I always say that spanking occupies the place in my life that sex occupies in the lives of most people. Which is to say, when I was a kid, I was never curious about sex. I was only ever curious about spanking. When I masturbate, and this was true when, from my first tentative steps into discovering sexuality and discovering my body, mm. I never ever thought about sex, any kind of sex. I only ever thought about spanking. Mm. Um, I, I feel I'm not sex averse. And some people uh, tell me I'm asexual. I'm not asexual because I have a very clear and robust sexual identity and sexual life. It just doesn't involve sex. It, mm. it just spanking occupies that space in every way. It's my fantasy life. It is how I express attraction. It is how I receive love and attraction. Um, so if you just take sex in the lives of most people and replace it with spanking, I think that is what a spanko is. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. So, I'm curious, I think people get confused about this, because personally, as somebody in the BDSM community, when I say the term spanking, what I mean is typically bare hand on a butt or something that's very similar to that, like a gloved hand or like one of those like wooden hand paddles. Have you seen those? Like, yeah, those I've seen those, yeah. Yeah, like that, like very specifically, that is what spanking is. But my, from my understanding, in the spanko community, it's broader than like it can involve hairbrushes and things like that. Is that true? And does that cause any confusion when you're negotiating for spanking that spanking can involve so many different implements? Or like, how do you navigate that? Yeah, it, it absolutely can be confusing. And I think it would be fair to say that people who call themselves spankos or the spanko community, really what we are is discipline fetishists mm. or corporal punishment fetishists because in the spanko world you'll see a lot of like side dishes to spanking that have nothing to do with butts or impact play like mm. we um a lot of times in our scenes you'll see things like corner time or writing lines um and then some of it gets into closer to the world of impact play like kneeling on rice mm. um Basically anything that you may have heard of in Little House on the Prairie or <laughs> historical books, anything that sniffs around any kind of corporal punishment mm -hmm. or, um, or uh, like domestic violence, I got to say, um, is sort of the, the world that we're swimming around in. But of course, consensually, which transforms it from domestic violence into something really awesome and fun. Yeah. And I think that's pretty much true for a lot of BDSM is like, look, this could seem like abuse, but it's consensual. So please don't call the police. Everyone here is having a fun time. If they're not, they have safe words. Like we have XYZ plan in place. Now, oh gosh, I have like so many things I want to ask. So I'm going to start. No, with, I have like, questions I want to ask you too. Okay. Oh my gosh. Well, like, hey, just chime in if you have a question because we could talk for hours probably. But my initial question is when it comes to that, like, confusion about like is this domestic violence is this consensual how does that like connect in any way 
to like Christian domestic discipline because I think a lot of people also get confused between like spanking fetishists and like people that are using like religious overtones to have a certain way of managing their household let's charitably say yeah like the head of house taking mm. in hand kind of Christian domestic discipline mm -hmm. thing um I have nothing but respect for that community and for people mm. who choose to live that lifestyle provided they have the self-awareness to say that they find this super sexy and that mm. they they I mean I I I'm resistant to some voices in the CDB community that insist that they have nothing to do with BDSM or people like us because mm. to me it's very clear that there there is some kind of sexual satisfaction they're getting out of this lifestyle. I understand the appeal. I understand why they find it sexy. I think the headspace is similar to the headspace that a lot of Spankos I know are swimming around in. Mm. Um, but I, I do think it is dangerous and problematic for people to promote a kind of um, ab ab abusive lifestyle or, or mm. let me say a, a, a seemingly abusive lifestyle without having the self-awareness to say, no, 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 this isn't real abuse. This is consensual and this is sexy for us. We do it because we like it. We do it because it, it gratifies an inner need and turns us on and makes us feel loved and makes us feel like we can express love. Um, when, they, when I hear people in the, in the CDD community saying things like, well, this is what God wants. God mm. placed women below men, um, which of, of course is something I bristle at um I, I think that i think that not only are they lying to other people i think they are lying to themselves mm. and i i struggle with that yeah i mean i also sort of sit on the fence as someone that was like raised in a catholic household and i definitely did not have anything near like that in my household to be clear but hearing that religious background and again that sort of like resistance of like oh we're not like those people over there that do spanking for sexy reasons yeah. we do it because god says we should and it's like yes. does god make your pants tingle when you do it though <laughs> like yeah I, like, I have questions no i mean i i i i wish i could just ask straight up a lot of these people do you think about discipline when you masturbate because i bet they do god knows i do um mm. And I don't know, I, I think that there's nothing to be gained from lying to ourselves or being in denial about the motivations behind our choices. Like, yeah, so. Yeah, exactly. And I, you know, if any, I don't know how many people in my audience would identify as being part of that lifestyle, but, yeah. you know, just be honest with yourself, honestly. And that's true for all kinks. And I find that a lot of people struggle with that. Like, they know they have a kink, they might be into something, and there can be a really long process of coming to terms with it and realizing this is who I am. This is what I want in my relationships. Did you have any struggle with that? Like, especially in your like initial dating part of your life or was it something where you always knew and could like openly talk about like, Hey, I'm into spanking. That's what I want in my relationships. No, it was exceptionally difficult. Mm. It was um, extremely, extremely difficult and very confusing mm. because I, I sort of knew, I, I always knew that I was, absolutely unbelievably obsessed with spanking my whole life like mm -hmm. from my very earliest childhood memories i remember just obsessing over cartoons you know sometimes in like looney tunes on saturday mornings uh one cartoon mouse would give a cartoon duck a spanking um and i would just i would be riveted mm -hmm. um and then as i got older there were little references in pop culture from time to time that would mention bdsm Mm. And that was also confusing and frustrating because a lot of pop cultural or mainstream depictions of BDSM were, they didn't feel relatable. Um, they felt quite sexy and sexual. And as I said, because spanking occupies the place in my life that sex occupies in the lives of most people, for me, it, it was never like I wanted to get a spanking and then have sex or wanted to mix the two in any kind of way. Mm -hmm. um, I feel, and I know that I'm not the only spanker who feels this way, we like to indulge in a kind of play style that absolutely is sexual, but has this very non-sexual 
veneer on it. We put a non-sexual filter on it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm my fiance is also a spanking fetishist. We actually met because he reached out to me because of my book. Um, and like we have had sex and it's fine, but we almost never have sex. We're both fully satisfied by discipline and spanking stuff. Mm-hmm. And so when I saw mainstream depictions of BDSM as a teenager, they always seemed a little more sexual and so that confused me and made me think I was broken in some way. Mm. Um, and so, no, I didn't, um, I, I didn't, I, I mean, like a lot of spanking fetishists, I couldn't even say the word spanking. I couldn't say it until I was about 26. Mm. And it was a big process of forcing myself to get comfortable saying that word. I know tons of people in the community who say like the S word or they make up a like, placeholder because saying that word is just too intense it's too overwhelming uh so no i I, (laughs) to answer your question no it was not easy for me to come to terms with this wow i mean even just not being able to say the word there's not even i'm sure people in bdsm are like that to some extent but that's just because in bdsm like as a general community not necessarily one avenue of it or another yeah. like they can be sexual for a lot of people but not even necessarily in the way where you're describing it where it replaces sex where like the act of bdsm is like so intense that you can't even be like i want to do the b thing you know by being yeah. bondage and like i'm not saying that to be derisive in any way to be clear i'm just like i'm so fascinated that it's it can just the word itself is so powerful and it makes sense in the context of this is so hard for me to even talk about like I have to whisper the word out and like write it down and say it really secretly but yeah yeah what was it that helped you become more open in talking about it and trying to find partners that were in alignment with you in that way so um this is what my book is about I Mm. for a long time worked um so I was As a young person, I liked Shakespeare as a fangirl. And then as I emerged into adulthood, I transitioned into working with Shakespeare in a professional capacity. Hmm. And yeah, I mean, as trite as it sounds, I really do think that Shakespeare helped me come to terms with this. Um, I think that Shakespeare is a bit like the Bible or other holy books in that you can kind of find whatever you're looking for in it. You can twist the words to be about whatever you need them to be about. And I did that with Shakespeare. Um, There is a Mm. moment in A Midsummer Night's Dream, you might be familiar with this moment, Mm. when um, Helena, one of the characters, says to the man that she is in love with, Demetrius, she says, um, spurn me, strike me, neglect me, lose me, but give me leave, unworthy as I am, to follow you. Um, And then she says um, something like, I'm, I'm forgetting the line now. Um, but she like kind of begs him to spurn her, strike her, and use her as he would use his dog. Um, and when I read that line for the first time as a teenager, of course, I found it very kinky and was like, well, shit, I mean, if, if there's space for kinky people in Shakespeare's world, then maybe I'm not fucked up after all. Yeah. So. Yeah, literature is so important. And I mean, I just hearing that, I'm like, yeah, that's kinky as hell. <laughs> like, yeah, yes, yeah, thank seems, you. You get it. Mm-hmm, yeah, I could totally, somebody somebody somewhere has that like embroidered or cross stitched on like a really nice thing and framed in their kink room. I'm sure somebody has that. Uh, yes. So I, I totally get that. But seeing yourself in literature or in media in some ways is so important. And I, I hear people who get that through like, powerful female figures in media or superhero movies or in books where it's like it's okay for me to be this like sexually dominant woman or it's okay to me to be just deviant or it's okay for me to like want to pretend to be a dog sometimes like and yeah yeah I you know as much as I think teenagers kind of scoff at like I have to read Shakespeare I have to read this book like (laughs) you know part of it is it can help you discover something in yourself reflected in a book that you might not see in your everyday life or with your peers and like it can be so so powerful and you know sometimes it's youtubers right sometimes it's streamers or you know whatever the modern equivalent of you know shakespeare is in the public platform but yeah yeah Yeah. so uh, i want to go back because i'm trying to remember the tree of like questions i have so Mm -hmm. switching gears i want to talk about like role play in in spanking culture because it sounds like there's this domestic discipline element to it is that like an important part of it to have role play on top or is that more of an optional thing? Yeah, I I feel like it's really important for me um, to mention, I'm of course speaking from my perspective Mm. and 
I like the majority of spanking fetishists. I know I am a disciplinary spanko and most spankos I know are, but I should acknowledge that um, I have friends in the spanko community who consider themselves non-disciplinary. They like spanking for its rhythmic qualities or for the power exchange or just for the pain. Mm -hmm. um, so I definitely should acknowledge that they exist. I can only speak from my own perspective as a disciplinary spanko. Um, yeah, I mean, I would say that role play is a huge part of it. And now I'm wondering how to even define role play, right? Because I'm in a, um, like a, what I guess you would call a 24 seven DD relationship with my daddy slash fiance. Um, I call him daddy, but you know, and I know that he's not my literal biological father. <laughs> yeah. um, so like, is that itself a role play? Like kind of, right? Like mm. that's, um, I mean, we're kind of living in a full time role play, sort of. Mm. Um, and and just the fact like I, I, I like to think that my fiance and I are both super aware that even though he disciplines me, and that's the dynamic that we both have consented to and are, and are satisfied by. I think we're both fully aware that we're grown ass adults living in 2022. Mm -hmm. And if I ever said, like, no, I don't consent to this. I don't deserve to be punished. Like, come at me with a hairbrush and I'm going to, you know, accuse you of assault. Uh, mm. Then then the, the scene would end right there. So, like, I think you could make the argument that we're living in a full-time role play. Mm. Um, but if you're acting about, like, asking about, like, intentional, specific, like, role play scenes, yeah, we do a lot of that. Sometimes mm. he's a you know, a religious leader. Sometimes he's a teacher. Sometimes he's, a, you know, <laughs> I, I'm sure I don't have to tell you. Yeah, it sounds, it's probably like a greatest hits list of like what's popular at <laughs> spanking parties where it's like the priest, the teacher, the professor, the mean mother, the yes. like 1950s father figure, like, uh, yeah. Babysitter. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know if I'm missing any ones in there that are really important. Probably like a school marm, like kind of more British influenced, I imagine. Yes, definitely. Mm hmm so I, I think that's really interesting. I, I kind of wonder how much overlap there is between like general BDSM culture and spanking culture because I recently took a class on spanking from someone named Miss Chris. I don't know if you're familiar. Oh, yeah, I know, I know her. Yeah, okay. So I, I, I'm interested because from what she said, it sounds like there's a lot of differences in spanking culture around things like consent or like safe word usage. And I was curious if you could speak to that a little bit because, you know, from, from my perspective, things like safe words and like explicit prior consent is like super important, but maybe that is not so much the environment that like spanking parties are geared towards. It sounds like it's a little bit more like swinging culture with more of like an implied consent because you're there. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I'm curious to, to learn more from mm -hmm. you because my, my own experience in the broader BDSM scene is outdated. It's from like 10 years ago. I'm mm -hmm. told that a lot has changed since then. Mm -hmm. um, and I even then 10 years ago, I wasn't very involved myself. I was still kind of searching for my place. Mm -hmm. um, I do have the impression that formalized sort of um, explicit conversations about consent and establishing safe words and discussing hard limits and discussing boundaries is a little more italicized in the broader BDSM scene. Mm. Um, but I mean, correct me if I'm wrong about mm. that. Um, my experience is that, yeah, I, I think, I, I think I agree with what Ms. Chris said. Um, I think there's a kind of, I mean, certainly everything that happens is consensual. Mm -hmm. Everyone has the right to um, say red at any time. Red mm -hmm. is sort of established as like a universal safe word. Mm -hmm. um, but usually when I go to spanking parties, I, someone says, hey, do you want to play? And I'll just be like, yeah. And then we don't normally sit down and like have an extended conversation about that. Um, I, have, I have mixed feelings about that. I think it mm. might be better if those conversations, kinds of conversations were a little more normalized and expected. I think it's possible that because the um, Spanko scene is so small, it is much, much smaller than the broader BDSM community. Mm. And you, it, you know, everyone kind of knows everyone. Mm -hmm. And yeah. at, at a certain point, um, we're all sort of friends. Uh, and of course, new people enter the scene. But I, I mean, I don't know, you tell me, like, mm. if you went to a BDSM party with a bunch of people you've been playing with for years, 
Um, would you still before each scene sit down and be like, okay, let's, let's talk about the thing. Or do you, do you in the BDSM community, do you, do you reach a point with your play partners where you're like, okay, we know each other. We've kind of talked about this. We've played a bunch of times before we can just jump into this. I think it really depends. I know people that maybe because they have trauma backgrounds or they've had previous negative experiences, they will negotiate every single time in a lot of detail. But for me, I generally get to a place with my partners where we know that we're in sync about what it is that we want. We have kind of a defined list of like, okay, I know you know my limits. I know you know what my preferences are. And you can kind of yeah. mix and match what you want. But we still have conversations about like, where's our energy at today? What is it that we want to do? Do we want to do like soft and sensual? Do we want to do hard? Do we want to do mean? Like, because there's so many different energy flavors that you can play around with that even if you and your partner know each other really well, if you've been, you know, separated the whole day and you're meeting that night at the dungeon, you might not know, okay, like where's their head at? Or maybe you talked about like last week, okay, we're going to go to this party and we have kind of vague ideas of what it is we want to do and use that time before the play to really narrow down into, okay, this is what we're feeling right now in the moment. But it's not as detailed as what I would do with like a new play partner. Like I actually have like a negotiation checklist that I go through with people where, okay, this is what we're doing. This is what's on the table. Here's what's off the table. Title, safe words, aftercare plan. Like, do you have health insurance? If something goes really wrong, like, can I take you to the ER or can you not afford a $5,000 ambulance bill? Like, you know, things right. like that are, are more important, I think, because in BDSM, like, you can like, you can go to somebody at a dungeon and think you know what their style of play is, but it could be anything from, like, wax play, fire play, you know, a dildo they've hooked up to, like, a reciprocating saw, like, you know, yeah. there could be so many things that if you don't explicitly negotiate, you can end up with, like, ten things happening that you don't even know what they are, so, like, you have to be a little bit narrowed down, whereas I think it sounds like more in spanking, like, the set of things that can happen is already kind of so predefined that it's less of a mystery about like are they gonna pull out the fire cups like 10 minutes into the scene and like set my back on fire like you know so I think that um we sort of I think give the impression in BDSM that we do a lot of like really explicit negotiation and that can turn people off and then go well I don't want to do that it ruins the mood I, I have to be able to go with the flow and I think it's more that we encourage newer people and strangers to negotiate in a really explicit way because we have so many stories in our community about people getting their consent violated being taken advantage of by older more experienced people and yada yada yeah. where it's really important to negotiate up front with newer people but then you can get into a rhythm with people you know really well and then move into more of the space of like going with the flow and maybe kind of just going like hey you want to do bondage cool okay and then just like doing it and then being able yeah. to negotiate maybe during the process if something goes wrong or doesn't feel right or if you want to add something else in yeah like I I feel like I can already hear people yelling at me inside <laughs> my head so don't worry I know you're yelling at me right now um <laughs> I, I do think that the the Spanko menu uh, tends to be a shorter menu um, than the broader BDSM menu. Mm -hmm. um, like, for instance, I, you mentioned fire cups. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I don't even know what fire cups are. I'd be very excited to learn. Mm -hmm. uh, but certainly at a, at a spanking party, no one has ever, you know, whipped out the fire cups. Um, I, I do think it is good when Spankos negotiate scenes, particularly newcomers to the scene and mm -hmm. particularly with new partners, obviously, um, before they play. Um, I, I think I'm trying to unpack this a little. Mm. I'm, I'm wondering why, you know, cause in, in, I've gone to a lot of spanking parties and I have never ever uh, personally seen a spanking fetishist produce a physical written checklist of things to discuss in advance. Mm. Um, maybe, maybe we should be doing that. Um, but I, I do think that there is something to unpack here. And I'm going to think about this, uh, mm. I'm sure, even after we finish this conversation. I, I think that part of the problem is there is it's such an intense thing for Spankos and such um, so overwhelming and so tangled and twisted up that when you're dealing with a group of people who in many cases can't even say the word spanking out loud, mm. um, I wonder how effectively they're going to be able to negotiate something like, hey, by the way, please don't call me, 
you know, a brat because I have memories of my mother calling me that as a child and it's kind of triggering for me. So please mm -hmm. don't use that word in, in the scene. Um, I think that doing those, those kinds of negotiations requires a lot of really difficult introspection um, mm -hmm. that uh, I, I don't want to say not everyone wants to do it, but uh, I will say that it's not necessarily pleasant Mm -hmm. Um, and, and so I wonder if that slows us down a little bit, um, to, you know, have these important conversations. Um, but, you know, and I don't want to throw my own community mm -hmm. under the bus here. We absolutely do have these conversations. Uh, and although abuse does happen in our scene, like every scene, there's bad people everywhere. Um, for the most part, like all of the spanking fetishists I know are very responsible about boundaries, consent, safe words, things like this. Mm -hmm. Um, I think we just, um, perhaps formalize it a bit less than than some communities. Yeah, and I think I want to be clear, like, even within the BDSM community, I've had completely different experiences at every dungeon I've been to because depending on the laws where you live and what makes sense like financially that'll stay viable, you're going to get very different things. Cause, and I would love to talk about this. It sounds like most spanking parties are at temporary venues, like somebody's home or at a hotel yeah. as opposed to dungeons which have to like exist on their own and like be financially able to stay open and like pay the bills which leads to sort of interesting scenarios where like I have one dungeon I went to where it was it was a non-profit and it was like very much like hey here's an orientation you have to go to beforehand and you get taught like what a safe word is how to negotiate you have to practice saying no to each other do all this stuff to make sure you're prepared when you go to the party and then they have handouts they have signs on the walls that say like only yes means yes or whatever and then i've been yeah. to other venues where it's primarily a bar and they happen to have BDSM equipment there and they do that on certain nights of the week but it's owned by swingers and so they're kind of taking more of a swinger culture perspective on it which is kind of like you handle your own shit and like if you scream loudly enough it should stop <laughs> and like not necessarily yeah. being as explicit yeah. because it's about being in the mood being in the moment and going with the flow and then I've been to like places in in Europe where like nobody's supervising any of the equipment nobody talks about anything beforehand and like if you get on the spanking horse a stranger might just come up and like start spanking Thanking you. So it's it's very like a little bit of everywhere and like whether or not you would call some of these places like BDSM venues or dungeons is also sort of like, you know, is it a bar that has BDSM at it or is it a dungeon? Like they're calling it yeah. a dungeon, but does it really meet that threshold? Eh, you know. So yeah, it, it very much varies everywhere because different people are opening dungeons with different intentions about like what they want the space to be like. And again, like what can legally be in operation, what they can actually keep open because yeah. in a lot of places they have to have the bar because that is what actually makes the money. And the door tickets for the rest of the parties are just like, you know, a nice addition, but like the money maker is like selling the drinks. Yeah. And I, I'm sure that like formal dungeons have liability issues mm -hmm. that they need to be, I mean, they don't want to get sued. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, but you were absolutely right. Um, I, in my experience, spanking parties fall into kind of two categories. Uh, the vast majority of spanking parties are informal. They happen at someone's house or at a rented Airbnb, and mm. it's just a bunch of friends in an Airbnb sort of doing their own thing. Um, in the United States, there's a number of large national spanking parties. Uh, those tend to happen at hotels, big hotels that rent out an entire floor with different suites. They usually have a party suite, like a play suite, uh, and then people play in their rooms also. So it's um, certainly not um, like official dungeons dedicated for BDSM specifically. Mm -hmm. um, but I think you saw that I kind of had a, a gut reaction and kind of grimaced when mm. you described um, being at a space where someone could just walk up to someone and start spanking that person. Mm -hmm. um, that was a, an instinctive reaction. Um, mm. I, I didn't, I didn't mean to imply any judgment necessarily with yeah. that. I would not personally be comfortable with that, mm -hmm. but if other people choose to like go to that space and get on the spanking bench and hope that it happens, then cool, more power to them. Mm -hmm. um, I should be clear that when I say that uh, negotiations are a little less uh, formalized in the spanko scene, in my experience, um, I have never seen someone just walk up to uh, another person at the spanking sp party and start hitting that person. Uh, if that did happen, that would not be considered okay. Okay. That's good to know. Cause yeah. I think like, I am totally okay with a diverse 
variety of experiences when it comes to like how consent works in a space, but it's important to know what the rules are up front because I didn't know any better. This venue had purported itself to be like, ask for explicit consent, no means no, yes means yes. And actually they had signs that said, do not touch anyone without their permission. And now I know why those signs are there. And it's probably because they had a pre-existing problem of people acting in, you know, less than fully consensual ways. And I'm sure, you know, eight out of 10 people are like, oh my gosh, yes, somebody's spanking me. I love it. It's the best. And, you know, me, I'm an American. I'm in Europe. I don't know what the hell's going on. And I'm just like, oh, like, what's happening? And I didn't actually, to be clear, I didn't have somebody come up and spank me that didn't actually happen. I don't even think I got on the BDSM furniture when I was there, but I was wearing full body latex and I had people come up and, like, they were touching me, like, inappropriately mm-hmm. and getting really close to me, like, rubbing my latex. And I'm sure any latex fetishists who are watching or listening to this will, will be able to attest the fact that like it's very personal and like it is yeah. literally right ne- like it's skin tight and so like if somebody is touching me on my latex they're essentially touching me and and like my bare yeah. skin in any case that, that was my one experience uh with that but uh, with uh, spanking stuff I actually want to know about the airbnb situation because <sighs> I, I i understand that most airbnbs have very strict rules around like how many people can be there and like how loud things can be and like is it sort of like clandestine, like going under the radar type Airbnbs? Or is it like, are there Airbnbs that are like operated by like known people who are friendly to Spankos and like is just sort of like a, a whisper network of Spanko Airbnbs? So I am not aware of a whisper network of Spanko Airbnbs. Um, I know that a number of Spankos, if they host a great party at a great space that has plenty of bedrooms for everyone, mm. uh, usually these parties are multiple night parties, uh, like oh. a, from a Mm. from like a Thursday to a Monday. So they need enough bedrooms and beds for everyone to sleep. Um, and yeah, the, the Airbnbs often say no parties. So they, they, I mean, this tends to be kind of like clandestine bad behavior. <laughs> in in our experience, I mean, we work very hard to be very respectful of the space. We mm. leave Airbnbs clean. We don't mess them up. Um, as for the noise, it's it's always funny to us how hard it seems to be for non-fetishists to recognize the sound of a spanking. Oh. Um, I remember, yeah, I remember years ago, I when I was living in New York City, I was going to a lot of spanking parties at my friend's apartment. Mm-hmm. And um, we were like, okay, are people going to hear this? Because I mean, it's the sound of like a dozen spankings happening at the same time. Uh, and in some cases, this can get pretty loud. I mean, we use paddles, we use straps, we use belts, we use hairbrushes, as you said. Mm-hmm. Um, these can make some noise. And uh, we always wondered if, if other people might be listening. Uh, the closest we got to an answer to the question of whether other people were listening um, was that the host of these parties, uh, eventually at one point, her super told her that a neighbor had complained that she was always moving furniture. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess, I mean, when you hear slapping sounds over and over again, mm-hmm. I mean, my, my head would go to spanking, but I think mm-hmm. most people, they think exercise, they think moving furniture, they, mm-hmm. they just, I mean, it, I guess some people in the world aren't thinking about spanking 100% of the time. It's, it's hard for me to imagine, but <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's interesting. And then you said there are multiple nights. So I'll just make a quick comparison for BDSM conventions because you also mentioned like ones that are hosted at hotels. In BDSM conventions, like typically it's education focused during the day. Not all of them are like this, but the ones that I go to are like this, where it's education during the day from like 9 a.m. at the earliest to maybe like 3, 4 p.m. And there's typically like a dinner break. People go to their hotel rooms, they freshen up. And then the dungeon space opens from, you know, 6, 7 p.m. until... 2, 3 a.m. And then you you do that until you're done playing and then you go to sleep and you wake up and you do more classes. And not everyone does the classes, but like primarily you're going because you can learn about how to do this one bondage thing and then you can practice it the same night at the dungeon and that's really like fun and exciting. But there's not like private play in, well, there the focus is like the public space and using all the wonderful furniture and the lights and the, the music and the vibe of everything not so much like going back to someone's hotel room to go and play. And actually I, I know that people do like private meetups in their hotel rooms, but it's also not even typically for play. It's like, Hey, come to my hotel room. We have a back balcony, like come have a cigar or like, you know, we're going to do more of a demonstration on flogging because we ran out of time during the class. Like it's not about private play sessions. And actually I've never had anyone come up to me that I've negotiated with at 
a BDSM convention, like even suggest going to a hotel room for play. Because if anything, it's seen as like kind of a red flag that like, why would you want to get me alone in private instead of playing with me at this like amazing, wonderful dungeon that we've kind of like bought tickets to go and use because it's so amazing. And um, I'm curious like how that's perceived in like spanking culture. Like one, is there like a class or educational component to spanking stuff like at all in general or at larger events? And two, like, how is, like, public play seen versus, like, private play and, like, inviting somebody to a hotel room for play? Yeah, sure. Um, I'll describe my experience, which, again, is just my experience. Please mm-hmm. stop yelling at me. Um, uh, how- I'll put a disclaimer on the screen that says <laughs> she is only talking about her experience. <laughs> just- Thank you. That's what I need. Um, so in my experience, at, at the big national Spanko parties that happen at hotels, usually on the first day, which tends to be a Wednesday, um, we, we can't wait to get started. Mm-hmm. Um, there, there's usually a couple, like, I'm not even going to say a couple classes. Usually there's like an introductory talk that the hosts give mm-hmm. where they say, like, just a reminder, red is going to be a universal safe word for this party. If at any point anyone says red, you have to respect that. Um, don't touch anyone without his or their consent, yada, 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 just sort of the basics. Um, Sometimes they um, talk a little bit about the the play zone, the kind of ideal area, the target area when you're spanking someone. Um, You don't Mm. want to go too high, of course. You don't want to wrap if you're using a strap or a belt. Um, So sometimes they talk a little bit about the sort of fundamentals, but I've never seen formal classes, certainly not from like morning until evening um usually usually play happens from morning until evening um and usually there is a like a party suite where people can play in public if they want to do a group scene or they just like to have other people watching Um, but i think the majority of play does happen in private rooms it's not considered weird to say hey do you want to come back to my hotel room and do a scene. Um, But I I think and hope that people tend to feel safe because this is usually an environment where the entire floor of a hotel is rented out. Uh, So these these rooms, they don't feel distant. Um, hmm. No one has ever said to me at a party, hey, do you want to come back with me to my house to play? I think that would make me feel a little unsafe. Hmm. Um, It's usually like we're in a public suite and someone says, well, we're in room 303. I'm in room 307. Do you want to go down to room 307 and do a scene? Mm. Um, so, I, yeah, I, I don't think that is considered weird at um, at spanking parties. Okay. That's interesting because at the conventions I've been to, and I certainly have not been to all of them, there are a lot, yeah. uh, most of them, uh, they're ones that used to be hotel takeovers, but it tends to be hard to, like, I mean, literally every floor of the event is is just, like, people who are there for the convention. There's occasionally ones that are, like, certain floors are reserved for BDSM folks, but a lot of people tend to either be local or they tend to get Airbnbs or there's, like, hotels mm. that are nearby they go to instead. So people tend to be, I think, a little bit yeah. more broken up and I think that kind of facilitates the like okay why would you invite me back to the hotel room and like couples that come together or groups of friends that come together will play with each other in the the hotel space as well but I think there's more of a public aspect to doing BDSM than it sounds like there is for spanking which is really interesting is it does it tend to like mentally be more of like an individual like I'm here with this person I'm not thinking about anything going on with other people nearby or people watching me? Like, is is voyeurism and exhibitionism not really a component for spanking for a lot of people? Or or do you know? I think exhibitionism is definitely a part of it. And mm. certainly we do group scenes. Um, certainly, like, I have very much enjoyed scenes that I did in public where people were watching and I got a lot of energy from the, the vibe mm. in the room. Um, so, you know, pu- public stuff absolutely does happen. I think that part of it may be... I'm trying to imagine what a Spanko dungeon would look like now and how I would feel about it. Mm. Um, and I think I'd be extremely fucking excited. I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. I don't know if I can. Oh, no, go swear. Uh, swear freely. <laughs> good, good, good. Uh, I think I would, I think if such a thing as a Spanko dungeon existed, that would be fantastic. And I would absolutely want to play in it. I'm, I'm imagining what it would look like. I feel like it would look like a sort of 1800s little house on the prairie style school room or like, a, I don't know, like a, like a Dickensian orphanage or, or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we, our, our, our version of a dungeon would have to be uh, fairly specific um, and 
headspacey. Mm. Uh, but I think if we had something like that, I don't think people would be so inclined to leave. Um, uh, so is, <laughs> it, is, is it more like the public spaces aren't really like decorated so much they don't really have like a role play vibe to them oh no okay. they're really just hotel rooms so like the private hotel rooms and the main party suite are kind of i mean the, the vibe is the same they're just hotel ah. rooms mm -hmm. um and i think so much of our play style is it tends to be very domestic or mm -hmm. educational um and so you can you can pull off uh kind of I don't know, you were rude to mommy scene in a hotel room as well as you can in another hotel room, mm -hmm. I guess. Um, and I think maybe um, if I may say, I suspect that it's possible that the kind of toys we play with, like, as I said, hairbrushes and paddles and belts and straps, mm -hmm. um, maybe are a little more user friendly than some um, like I, I have a friend in the BDSM, in the rope mm -hmm. scene. Uh, she's a rope bunny who I was very curious to try suspension. And so she um, tied me up and, and su I was suspended me. And she was talking about how much she had to study and learn to safely mm -hmm. do these ro ropes and safely mm -hmm. um, put someone in this position. Mm -hmm. I, I don't want to say that there is nothing to learn in spanking. There absolutely is. Mm -hmm. And things get dangerous when kind of newcomers walk into the scene and think, I already know everything I need to know. I have mm -hmm. nothing to learn. So there's definitely still things to learn. But um, I, I, I would venture to say that I think administering a spanking is a little more intuitive and uh, easy to figure out on your own than learning how to safely you know, tie someone to the ceiling. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. And like also like rope bondage conventions, like that's also sort of its own culture within BDSM. Like Ooh. bondage I think is definitely more velcroed together because it's in the acronym, right? It's BDSM. But particularly when you get into like rope suspension, like what you did, like there are people who just do that. They don't do anything else in BDSM. They just rope all day, every day. That's that's all they do. Uh, it's but, a highly specialized skill. Mm -hmm. You don't really have time. Like if you're if you're just learning how to do that, you're like, why? Like I don't have room in my head right now to learn how to do these thirty other things. I just have to like narrow into this. So it makes sense. But I think you're right that within Kinkley we have a lot more like complicated instruments that we can use. Like people do stuff with medical play, right? They do like sounding. They do yeah. things with staples. I'm not gonna get into the gory details, but like you, they do things that are really complicated. The thing I mentioned earlier, I'll explain what fire cupping is. So fire cupping. If you ever like watch the Olympics. So you remember seeing like Michael Phelps or whoever with like the big like, oh, circular yeah. breezes. So those cupping comes in like kind of two forms. It's like suction cupping, which is literally just like taking a little like basically almost looks like a small glass or like a dessert dish and you just suck up the skin and it, it causes the circulation to rise up such that like blood like flows into that part of the skin and it causes bruises. You can also do the same thing with fire to create the suction and you basically take a fire like a lit wand essentially uh, that looks like something you'd see like a like a fire spinner like poi if you've seen mm. that use you light a cup really quickly and then you put it on the skin and it causes the same sort of like reaction with the bruise and it's actually very relaxing most of the time it can be used in a pain way but it tends to be more like sensation relaxation used with other types of you know similar play like maybe using ice cubes or feathers or things like that but yeah, most people are not going to walk off the street and look at the materials you use for fire cupping and go, I know how to use this. Unlike yes. with a hairbrush, you go, hairbrush, connect to bottom. I can probably figure that out. Figure you know? this out. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And particularly if you're if, uh, if a top is new to the scene or a switch who is topping, mm. um, is, is playing for the first time, perhaps. Um, yeah, as long as you are talking to your partner, you can kind of figure out how to administer a satisfactory spanking. Um, mm -hmm. And as, as long as you keep, you know, stay humble and, and ask mm -hmm. questions and make sure that your partner is enjoying it. Um, whereas, you know, what you're describing with fire cupping, like if you handed me a fire, I wouldn't know where to begin. Mm -hmm. uh, so it sounds like it's maybe a little less intuitive and therefore requires a little more formal education. Yeah, and, and also on top of it, because I think there's kind of this difference in like what draws people to these areas of like alternative lifestyle-ness like if you're really mm. into spanking and like that's your thing that's your fetish and you watch porn of it and read erotica about it and you do that for 10 years before you ever even step into a spanking party like you've kind of read descriptions of how and seen demonstrations of how spanking is done for years before you ever do it yourself and 
I am certainly not one to say that a single, you know, porn video or something is a complete education, but it's, you know, it's something to go off of. Whereas like when most people get introduced to a lot of kinks, like something like fire cupping, most people don't come into BDSM with a fire cupping fetish. They go, they see somebody else do it in a dungeon. They go, that looks fucking cool as hell. I want to do that. And then they take a class on it and they learn how to do it that way because I'm sure if you looked on kink.com long enough, you would find somebody who's incorporated fire cupping into a scenario, yeah. but it's not like top of the list. So I also sort of get there's a difference in like sort of what maybe not perfect, but like intuitive education you come in with when spanking happens versus, you know, certain areas of kink. And that can be a problem because every single spanko I have ever met has been absolutely obsessed with spanking from their earliest childhood memories. Mm. Um, a very common thing in the community is that a lot of us, when we were children, we so obsessively looked up the word spanking in the dictionary and just read the definition over and over and over again, that for a lot of us, when we were kids, our family dictionary automatically fell open to that page because we were always going to that page and mm -hmm. looking for it. Uh, but this can, this can actually be a problem because mm. I, um, a couple of times I've seen newcomers to the scene walk in thinking, I already know everything. It, this has been inside me my whole life. I've been obsessing about this forever. I know what I'm doing. Mm. And they forget to remain humble and receptive to the messages they're getting from other people and from their play partners. Mm -hmm. And that can be a problem. Yeah. Yeah. Humility is a problem no matter what scene you're in. I feel like bondage, <laughs> BDSM in general, spanking, like there's always going to be those people who are like, I already got this. Why would I need to? I got this. Or yeah. Ask anyone if what I'm doing feels good. I just, I'm, I'm hot shit. But I'm, I'm curious because it sounds like in spanking, you do also use the term terms like top switch and bottom or like are there other terms that people use that are more spanking specific or is it just really those ones um so when we use terms like ddlg or cgl uh caregiver litter care caregiver caregiver little that's hard mm. to say three times fast caregiver <laughs> yeah. little um which is sort of the gender neutral way to say um like ddlg which is uh daddy dom little girl mm -hmm. or um like mommy little boy um, so we use terms like that. Um, sometimes you hear a little bit of the language from the Christian domestic discipline community leak in like head uh, of household. Mm -hmm. Um, but less often, uh, mm -hmm. I, 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 I hear the term head of household much more often from uh, CDT, CDD than I do from Spankos. Um, yeah, mostly I hear top bottom. Sometimes I hear dominant submissive, um, yeah, but most, mostly top and bottom. Yeah, but it also sounds like from what you said earlier that power exchange is not typically a big part of most people's involvement in spanking, which I think is interesting because also combined with what you said earlier, it doesn't really sound like there's like casual participants in like spanking culture. It's like you're there because you're like hardcore into it and like you've loved this your entire life and this is like your thing. I mean, that is the case with the Spankos I have met. Yeah, mm. that um, it's it's been everything for our whole entire lives. Mm -hmm. um, something that was hard for me as I was kind of unpacking this is because there's just more references to BDSM in pop culture um, mm. than there are references to specifically spanking fetishists. Mm -hmm. um, I, at first I thought, oh, okay, maybe I'm just kinky. I'm, I'm kinky. That's, that's the deal. Like people in BDSM, they do spanking and that's what I've been obsessed with my whole life. So mm -hmm. yeah, the, BDSM, that's the place for me because 10 years ago when I was first coming out to myself, um, I started going to some BDSM events and I went to some dungeons in New York city where I lived at the time. And, and 10 years ago, I got two messages when I, tried to say in my clumsy, awkward, unable to say the word spanking out loud way, when mm -hmm. I tried to convey to people that that's what I was interested in, I got two very different reactions. Mm. The first was I got this kind of, oh yeah, we were all into spanking at, at the beginning, but trust me, like you'll, you'll learn about the, the you'll level up, mm -hmm. um, which was kind of condescending and not accurate. I, there's, yeah. it's not like spanking is not like, BDSM 101 or beginner BDSM. It is um, a full and valid fetish of its own. Mm -hmm. And certainly it is something that people can incorporate into the wonderful wide world of BDSM if they want to. But um, it's it's certainly not like, like yeah, it was not true when people were like, oh, don't worry, with time and exposure, you'll, you'll get into the really hardcore stuff. No, 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 that wasn't the case. 
Um, and then the other reaction I got is that when people in the BDSM scene in New York did see me play 10 years ago, <laughs> they rather quickly got squicked out by the kind of play style that I gravitate towards because oh. it, it is very domestic violence E. Um, it's, oh. it's consensual, it's not domestic violence, mm -hmm. but it is essentially a domestic violence role play. Um, mm -hmm. And likewise, I was very surprised when I saw the people I met at the dungeon I went to in Manhattan when I when I saw their version of spanking, because honestly, it, like they're very different. Like even oh, the style of okay. my experience, um, very very different. Um, I'm not quite sure how much detail to go into. No, but, you can go into um, as much detail <laughs> as you want. I I am here for it. <laughs> um, it just. And I, I think um, I know that some people I met in the dungeon I went to in Manhattan were kind of squicked out by the disciplinary vibe. They were like, why does this have to be a punishment? Why do you have to pretend that it's a punishment or, or something like that? Um, but I, I still have some very close friends who are very involved in the Spanko scene and the broader BDSM scene. And they tell me that this has changed a lot, that there's yeah. a lot like that basically the kind of condescending spanking is just BDSM 101. They say that's pretty much gone now, which is great. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they say that, you know, even when people are like, okay, I'm not so into the disciplinary thing, but that's your thing. That's cool. Mm -hmm. You do you. Um, so I think two things have changed. Yeah. I mean, I think there is always an ebb and flow to like what's popular in a community and so much. And I think we kind of forget this. The BDSM community, though, it is larger than spanking culture is, is still very small. And so like what mm. like the head person's opinion is that like runs a local munch or right. owns a local dungeon, like his or hers. And it's usually his because like almost all the shit is owned by like white cis head men. Let's be honest. Like yeah. like what their opinion is of certain things trickles down into like what their dungeon monitors do, how people in the local community perceive things. And so if they're closed off about certain stuff, it definitely reflects in like what other people like think is like the norm or how they should act when they see something. And I think maybe one factor that's changed like the domestic discipline perspective is like you mentioned DDLG and CGL. We also use that within BDSM. And I actually consider those things to be like primarily BDSM terms, but I am trying to get an interview with people who identify like primarily as CGL and DDLG. So I'll ask them about that. But yeah. I would consider those to be more like BDSM identities personally, because that's how I've interfaced with them. But that can be very much like punishment, discipline focused. And for a long time, that segment of kink or whatever it is, was very much like, I don't know if looked down on is the right word, but like reviled maybe where mm -hmm. they were kind of seen as like, they need to be over there in their own space because their kink grosses me out. I don't know why anyone would want, want to do this. It reminds me of like child abuse. Like why would we want to go anywhere near this is gross. And I think now it's just become so common that people have the old fuddy duddies have had to like accept it as being a thing. Yeah. And so many people get into BDSM now from that as their starting point to where it's like a lot of new people. I would say I'm going to guess that like 20% of my audience is people who in some way have CGL or GDLG as like either part of what they currently do or as part of their starting point in BDSM. So people have had to kind of accept like domestic discipline, especially like parent child or like older sibling babysitter type scenarios as like what they're going to see at dungeons. And certainly with the spanking being an intro play thing, I think people get confused with like, here's recommendations for like what a newer person to BDSM might want to explore in because it's cheap. You just need your hand, right? It's more <laughs> intuitive, like, and translate that into only newbies do this, which is wrong. And I, I hope that maybe channels like mine, other people like What's the Safe Word, other more mainstream educators that teach at dungeons and teach at conventions, like we've kind of drilled it in that like, any kink you want to do is fine. If you just want to do spanking, great. If you just want to do bondage, great. If you want to do every part of the BDSNM acronym, awesome. Just like negotiate yeah. for it, learn about it a little bit so you don't hurt yourself. And like, that's pretty much all you need to do. But there's always going to be people that are like, hmm, you mean that you still do spanking? You mean that you still use leather cuffs? Oh my God, that's so basic. Like there's always going to be people yeah. that are like that. And I think they're getting fewer and farther between it. I would actually say that 
I, again, every dungeon I've been to is different. Uh, there are a lot of people at the dungeon that I used to go to that are really into like caning and discipline and spanking and like that's their taster thing they do with new people is like, hey, you want to try caning? Which like new people are brave for trying caning. I don't know if that's like is caning part of like spanking culture? Like, is that one of the implements yeah. that people use? Okay, I figured it would be because like it definitely is. Just mm-hmm. think of any corporal punishment disciplinary vibe it's it's going to be part of it yeah yeah so i think it's changed but i think there is still that elitist attitude in certain segments of it and i'm trying really hard and most people i know that are currently educators are trying to break down the like stop judging other people for their kinks and just let people like what they like and also this idea of like if you don't want to see something in a dungeon it's their fault and they don't have to be they should just stop and changing that into, you know, you are responsible for your own mental well-being. And yeah. they're allowed to be here. If they're following the rules, you're not the DM. It's not your business to decide who plays or not. Go watch yeah. a different scene. Put your plugs in. Take a break outside. Like, people are allowed to have their kinks and be that DDLG or domestic discipline or, like, consensual non-consent play of any kind. And it's just something that people need to just, like, you know, oh God, there's this one erotica that I read once that's like somebody walked into a dungeon after like getting in a car accident. And they're like, please help me. I got in a car accident. I don't know what to do. Help me. I'm not from around here. And they walk into this dungeon and they see people playing and they get mad. They're like, oh my God, these women are being abused. I need to stop this. And they go around like trying to stop people's scenes. And I'm like, Oh my god. Of course she gets disciplined after that. That's like she gets, her first scene is she gets a spanking as like discipline for like interrupting people, which would never happen in a real dungeon for the record. Like they would just the police would be called. They would be kicked out. But Yeah. Well uh, and yeah. to um like we're kind of guilty of this or I've seen members of the Spanko community being guilty of the same thing. Mm-hmm. So to give the opposite side of this coin, um I, I think again this is ebbing out. But I, I have met older people in the Spanko scene, um sort of original generation, a few people who try to insist that we're not part of the BDSM tree, which is just ridiculous to me. They, Mm -hmm. they do this. Oh, I'm not into BDSM. I'm into spanking. And like, I do use terms like BDSM and spanko because I do think it's like, I do think we are a branch of the tree. We're our Mm -hmm. own branch. Um, And it's important sometimes to talk about us as a a distinct branch, but we're still part of the tree. Um, So when I use these terms, I'm certainly not trying to distance ourselves from BDSM at all. Um, I think we're part of it. We're just, you know, a certain specific flavor, just like rope bunnies might be a specific flavor or people who are super into latex or rubber are a Mm -hmm. specific flavor. Yeah, exactly. And I think uh, the superiority, like, complex that can happen in BDSM over, like, other kind of more specialized kinks is just so unnecessary. And, like, personally, I'm like, if you want to think of yourselves as separate, like, I that's not my place to judge. But I think there are enough similarities where I think for maybe, I don't know if political is the right term, but, like, for the purposes of you know, furthering acceptance of, like, alternative expressions of intimacy and sexuality. Like, I feel like it makes sense for us to, like, be friendly with each other and see that we have similar needs and interests in the way that we want to be represented and, like, you know, not demonized in, you know, what we would call vanilla culture. Is there a term that Spankos use for non-Spankos? Is it vanilla or is it something else? Yeah, so, um, they use the term vanilla for sure. Mm. Um, I personally have sort of stopped using it because I, I don't think it's particularly useful for my purposes. I see. Um, and also, I, I kind of feel like there's a, a moment happening culturally where terms like kinky and vanilla have been so watered down that they don't really believe, they, they don't really mean anything anymore. Like, does anyone identify as vanilla these days? Like, I, yeah, I, I don't know. It's, it's few I, and far between. Yeah. I, Six and everyone I know is like, oh, I'm so kinky. Like I go into fet life these days, and all I see are people who's like, my fetish is blowjobs. So I don't, I don't. I mean, I sure, like, great. I think like the second most popular kink on fet life is like anal, and I'm like, th- just having anal by itself is not like implicitly. It's yeah, I yeah, I I, I feel that for sure. I mean, I, so I guess I would say I don't really see the utility of terms like vanilla mm-hmm. because if no one identifies as vanilla, then what are we talking about here? Um, So Mm -hmm. sometimes I, so a term that I use a lot is sex oriented um, because I am trying to 
draw a line between people who are oriented towards a paraphilia, which is an object identity or activity that is not sex, uh, and people who are oriented towards sex. I, I think that there is a really valuable conversation to be had about the difference there, which is why I use that term. Mm -hmm. But that's just me with my own political agenda. The mm -hmm. Spanko community as a whole uses the term vanilla. Okay, yeah. And I even think even within kink, we're kind of moving away from the term vanilla because um, people who get labeled as vanilla have a very adverse reaction to it. They go, I'm yes. not vanilla. Don't insult me. And I'm like, I don't know. It's not an insult. I'm just like, you're not into BDSM. Yeah. And like, it just means like not into, like, it's okay. Like, uh, nobody's judging you for liking sex. Uh, just so there's yeah. sort of this reflexive, like, oh, don't call me vanilla. You're trying to insult me. And it's like, no, it's just a term where people are, are I think, more going towards like non kinky or just like not into BDSM, which I think is like, yeah. like, it's not as concise as of a term. But you know, I never want to offend people. And I never use vanilla as an insult personally and I think it mostly ends up being people who have like recently kind of spread their kinky wings and now they're being like haha all you vanilla unwoke people down there who yeah. don't know what they're missing it's like no they just like most people I know that are um you know vanilla or just non-kinky they've gone through a period of exploration where they've tried stuff and they just they're just not into it they're just like it doesn't do anything for them they just they want the penis in the vagina or the penis in the butthole or whatever combination they like. And that's, that's all they want. They don't really want anything else added on to that. And that's how they see it is like, it's added on to, and it's, you know. Yeah. Um, and, and that's part of why I find um, the, the term vanilla not particularly useful mm -hmm. because I feel like you very closely just described me. Mm -hmm. I have um, with, if you replace penis in vagina or butthole with a uh, hand or hairbrush on but, but yeah. anyway, like mm -hmm. I have done the thing. I've done the exploration. I've tried bondage. I've tried mm -hmm. shibari. Um, and I just am, I, like, I'm not squicked out by it, but I just am very kind of ambivalent about it. I'm, mm -hmm. I, I don't consider myself very adventurous. I, I'm not kinky. Like, mm -hmm. I, I don't have an adventurous desire to explore and experience different things. I'm like mm -hmm. the Spanko equivalent of someone who just wants missionary sex all the time which in my case means I just want over the knee spankings all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and so like, does that make me vanilla? Like, well, no, it doesn't. But um, like, how, how, how useful are these broad strokes terms? Mm -hmm. Because there definitely are spankos who are extremely kinky and they love to you know, try different things and experiment with different um, a a flavors of the, the BDSM menu. Mm -hmm. um, but just not everyone is like that. And that's okay, you know? Yeah, yeah, and I, I think that's true, and I think with, when it comes to terms like vanilla or kinky or whatever, I, it's about, like, for me, it should have utility in the sense that it starts a conversation. Like, because yeah. even if you say you're kinky, like, are you into spanking? Are you into bondage? Are, which part of the BDSNM, which is also, like, not even just four words, but it's, like, bondage, discipline, dominance, sadism, submission, and then masochism. Like, yeah. there's, there's a lot in there, okay? So which part of that are you into? And I find that, um, you know, just saying you're kinky by itself doesn't really mean a whole lot because that can mean anything from, like, I like choking during sex to, you know, I want an MS relationship that's 24 seven and we live yeah. this lifestyle and you know we go to these things and you know so as long as it just starts the conversation I'm fine with it but you know if it's it's I don't know if that terminating cliche is the term but uh, like if it, yeah. if you just stop at kinky and that's it like it's not really helpful so yeah I, I yeah like I I agree with you about starting conversations and I definitely use words like kinky and vanilla sometimes just because I have to because they're shorter and because they're widely understood mm -hmm. um but I I find that in my experience like you said terms like vanilla tend to end conversations because the second you introduce that someone is offended by the term or like, how dare you accuse me of being vanilla or this mm -hmm. or that. And yeah, it kind of derails boring. the conversation. Yeah. And it's yeah. Like, they, no. they think, yeah. They think it means mm -hmm. boring and it mm -hmm. doesn't. Yeah. It's like, again, you're allowed to like whatever kink you like or not like any kinks at all. And it's like, I don't know if this is more internal judgment, but I think we're kind of having a moment currently where like kink and like, deviance is seen as good in this like weird commercialized way where like music videos fashion I did a whole video about this like a couple months ago where like we're having this moment where like kinky weird being into a lot of stuff and deviant is 
seen as good and desirable. Like, regardless of, like, if you actually compare what these people were doing versus, like, what people do at BDSM Dungeons, like, it's probably not really anything special or weird, but there's this value yeah. that gets placed on it where you you don't want to be boring. Or, like, you know, I'm also part of the poly community, and there's a lot of pressure currently, I think, in a lot of polyamorous spaces for people to be into kink and do all the different types of sex with all the different types of genitals. And there's a lot of people that just aren't into that and don't want that and feel like they don't have a space and feel like they're looked down upon because they don't. And so like, I want to make room for those people who feel like, you know, I don't want, again, I don't want anybody to feel excluded or looked down upon just because they don't like the same things as me. That's so childish. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think it goes the opposite way. Um, I also am poly and, um, in the Spanko community, a lot of people are ethical non-monogamy is very, very common. Mm. But I think there is some pressure, you know, not that's not right for everyone. Some people sincerely mm -hmm. want to be monogamous and are monogamous. And I think there is some pressure in the Spanko scene at the moment for people to be ethically non-monogamous or even polyam because it's woke or because it's cool. Mm -hmm. um, when I wish that there was just a lot of emphasis on supporting people to be who they are and who they want to be. And if mm -hmm. that is monogamous, that's cool. If that's polyam, that's cool too. If, um, if it's um, any other point on that spectrum, that's also cool. Um, and the same goes for this kink vanilla spectrum. Like I, I wish people just felt supported to be who they are. Yeah. And it's, uh, you know, it's also the same way in BDSM where, you know, I, get comments from people that are like where are the monogamous people like is anyone monogamous that does bdsm like they they think from well and also it sort of depends on how you construct monogamy like if you go to a spanking party and a and a stranger spanks you like is that a violation of monogamy like for some people i imagine yes for some people no because in bdsm it's like i some people are they are monogamous in the sense that they're romantically exclusive, but they may platonically play with other people who aren't their partner just for fun to get to do something different. Like in the same way you'd go, you know, rock climbing with a friend. It's not like considered cheating to go hiking. Well, unless you're like a really paranoid person, you may consider going on a hiking trip with like the gender of the, you know, your partner's attracted to this gender. They're going on a trip with a person like that. Oh no, they're going to cheat on you. Like, no, just have more trust, have more faith in that. But yeah, it's it, the pressure goes in every direction. It feels like everyone, college students, poly people, like everyone's like trying to be everything all at once instead of like actually being like honest about what their needs are and feeling like they have space to to be true to that, you know. Yeah, I, I think you just said a mouthful. I think that's <laughs> absolutely right. I think I think a lot of people are trying to be everything all at once now. But I think I would love to say or love to hear you say again mm. um, that, yeah, these these labels are confusing. And so it's kind of hard to know ourselves when mm. the language we use to talk about our experiences, both to other people and to ourselves, is itself so undefined and in flux, um, which makes it a very exciting time to be part of the kink or BDSM family tree. Mm -hmm. um, but it also makes it a confusing time. We're, we're creating this language as we go, um, mm -hmm. which is an exciting thing. But we need to remember that that also makes it difficult. Yeah. Um, and so we need to be patient with ourselves as we figure this stuff out. Yes. And be patient with each other because, whew, if, like, r slash BDSM community, oh my gosh. Like, or just, like, BDSM Discord chats or Facebook groups, I'm sure, as well. Like, people get really strongly heated about, like, who can use the term master? What counts as being a master? And personally, I'm... I've just been around for too long. I don't want to get into definition arguments with strangers online. And I think that if it makes sense to you... And you can come up with a definition and reason for why you're using it, be it because it's hot and I like it and it turns me on and my BDSM is sexual, so that's why I use it, or I'm living in this traditional like MS leather lifestyle, whatever it is, you can use the term. You just have to be able to explain it to others and justify it to people who might have questions about it. Like if you're using yes. the term differently than what the standard definition is, like you should be able to explain why you're using it differently and just like be aware that people are going to have strong opinions but yeah it's very much all in flux we're all kind of I think defining and redefining terms that we've used for a long time and kind of settling maybe on where they end up or you know you have to remember that the labels we currently use especially when it comes to like sexual orientation are our current best guesses at trying to describe a very weird nuanced 
like thing that like broadly is like heterosexual is probably the most common because that is like what biologically makes sense but everything else beyond that comes in so many different flavors and and ways of feeling about it internally that our labels can only do so much because they're trying to describe it's like every shade of blue only but you only had the word blue for it you couldn't have like yeah. robin's egg blue like i have behind me or turquoise or whatever you know and yeah it, just, it gets confusing i like that color analogy that's mm -hmm. i think that hits the nail on the head mm -hmm. so uh, i know we're running out of time so really quickly before we wrap up before we started recording you mentioned that you actually started when you were in nairobi and i'm really curious to hear what the bdsm slash banking community is like in nairobi and then also in mexico city which is where you're currently located yeah um so the i mean you won't be surprised to hear that there are BDSM practitioners and fetishists and people with paraphilias all the frick over the world. Mm -hmm. um, and it, that's awesome and, and fun. Um, I, I do, I will say that in my experience, the, um, the fetish or BDSM scenes in a lot of countries outside of the United States and Europe are smaller. They're still mm -hmm. developing. Um, I'm sure that there are, cultural and economic factors that play into that. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it is very interesting for me to hear from Spankos around the world about how they're like the subtle differences in, in mm -hmm. spanking culture in, for instance, Singapore versus India versus Mexico. Mm -hmm. um, and something that that does surprise me a lot is how, you know, logically, it seems like Spanko culture and spanking fetish culture would be very influenced by culture, um, by which I mean, it seems like you'd, you'd think, or I would think at least, mm -hmm. that a lot of spanking fetishists in the United States would be very into paddles and belts and like traditionally American spanking implements, whereas the Brits would be very into canes um, or tosses. Mm -hmm. um, and while sometimes that holds true, it, that's not always the case. My daddy slash fiance is British and he is can't really be bothered by canes. He's much more into paddles and hairbrushes and and, mm. um, and, and tools like that. Um, so I think it's it's interesting to me mm. how sexuality seems to be in some cases influenced by culture, but in some cases rather distinct. Um, and I like that. I feel mm. like it validates my my feeling, um, I certainly feel, and I know a lot of spanking fetishists feel that we were born this way, that we were born with this obsession with spanking, that it's not a response to trauma, it's not influenced by culture, yada, 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 mm -hmm. that whole thing. Um, but yeah, it, it's kind of, you know, I, like I was surprised when my fiance, when we first started dating and, and he told me that he wasn't that into canes, I was like, really? But, but you're English. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's kind of, um, validating to to mm. see that our sexualities you know can can exist independent of our cultures yeah and have it be kind of something that exists like on a broad spectrum of like people from all over here can enjoy this thing i totally get why that would be validating and on the point of your fiance not necessarily being into canes I almost kind of wonder if it's a little bit of like sometimes what's farther away from you is more like erotically stimulating because like yeah. I, I probably imagine he didn't experience caning in school, but maybe I'm wrong. Um, yeah, he did not. Okay. It's like I, I almost think there's sometimes the things that are farther away from you, but still a little bit familiar can be more erotic than things that are kind of more part of your own own culture because it's like now this is even more different and maybe a little bit more taboo because it's different from what I do here. But I'm not, you know, I don't have any data about that, but. It's just so cool how this thing we do links us so strongly. Mm -hmm. Like I think about some of the, some of my the best friends that I made in Kenya, I made through this shared thing we do uh, here in Mexico. My very best friend that I've made since I moved to Mexico is himself a Spanko. Mm -hmm. um, and we've, bonded over that shared language and that shared culture and that shared history. And it's, um, I mean, it's, this, this is, I mentioned this in my book, but I'll, I'll tell this story because it's one of my favorites. Mm. Um, so before I wrote my book, I wrote a number of articles about spanking in the New York times and other publications. Mm. And in, in sort of the months before my book came out, I received an email from a Syrian refugee who was writing to me from a refugee camp in Jordan. She was able to read my New York Times article in English because before the civil war in Syria, she had been an English teacher. Mm. Um, but then her 
home was bombed and she had to flee. Mm. Um, and she, she emailed me because she wanted to talk about my article. <laughs> and I emailed her back and I was kind of like, well, we, yeah, we can definitely talk about like my stupid shit, but like you're, you're, you're well, a refugee. Yours, yeah. Like, yeah, I was, I was like, don't you have bigger problems? Like, do, shouldn't we talk about your problems? You're a war refugee. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'll never forget what she wrote back to me. She wrote, um, I have many problems in my life, yes but it is the loneliness that is the worst. It is mm. the feeling that I am broken. And uh, it just kind of blew my mind that, um, you know, in Kenya, in Mexico, all over the world, and even from a woman who had such a different life experience to mine, mm -hmm. this, this shared story that we have as people in the kink community or in the fetish community, or even just as in the community of sexual minorities, sexual subcultures, mm -hmm. this thing we do brings us together and helps us relate and understand each other. And uh, I think that's really beautiful around the whole damn world. Yes, yes. We're all, maybe we'll find world peace when we all have world leaders that all like spanking. Maybe that's, yeah. maybe that's what we need. Um, oh gosh, that is such a beautiful note to end on. And I just want to give you, is anything else you want to say or add on to this conversation before we wrap up? If there's anything you want to no, share. Not at all. As I said, thank you so much for everything you do. It's a really valuable service to you. People like me and people who I will never meet. So thank you. Yes. Thank you so much, Julian. And thank you so much for all of you for listening to this. If you guys have any comments, questions, anything else, you can put it in a comment in the comment section down below. And if they would like to reach out to you or find you, where can they find you, Julian? Oh, I am. Um, so my YouTube channel is called Kinking Out Loud. It's specifically about spanking from both a sexual and political perspective. Um, my book was published by Harper Collins about seven years ago. It's called Sex with Shakespeare, and it's on Audible and Kindle and Amazon and wherever books are sold. Um, and those are the best places to find me. I deleted my Twitter like a year ago, and I've mm. never been happier. So, <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I, uh, I am on Twitter currently, and I still feel that way. Don't get a Twitter account. It's bad for your mental health, but I need it because work reasons is what i tell myself so but, yeah <laughs> yes thank you so much for being here again uh links to your youtube channel anything else will be down below if people want to check that out real quick and again thank you all so much for watching if you guys want to make sure to catch up on all of my other interviews i have so many planned besides this one so make sure that you subscribe thank you all so much if you already do subscribe and if you support me over on patreon i do previews on my patreon of all these interviews so if you want to get these early that is the place to go, and I will talk to you again very soon. Bye!